It's your brother Benea Ben Israel, and welcome to Hebrew Israelite Research Episode One. That's Hebrew Israelite Research Episode One. Now, before we get started, I do want to show you a few things on our website. So, on your screen, you should see a web browser. And for this, I'm going to take you over to our brand new website. Now, for those that are interested in reviewing references, what we'll do is, you know, going forward, whenever we make a video, we're going to place all of those references on the website. So if you want to review the references after the video comes out, you will be able to go to the new website to view the references. All right, so on your screen, you'll see in the address bar, and if you want to follow along, that's fine. Just open up a web browser and type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Benea for Israel dot org. That's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash Benea for Israel dot org. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, click go on my browser and just to show you the new website. So on the website, we're still adding content. From time to time, just check back here for new content um, to see what we have. On our website, just to show you around a bit here, on the left-hand side, you'll see we have a link for YouTube videos. Here on this page, you'll be able to review or view the videos that we've published and should have our most recent videos here. And then in the middle of the screen, this will probably be the link that people use most. This is the link that we will use to review the video references. And then last but not least, on the right hand side, we do have a link for donations for those wishing to donate towards the awakening. And I do want to thank you in advance for those that do donate. All right. So back over to our video references. So let's click on our video reference link to see what's there. All right, so this is our video reference page, and it should bring up the most recent video references or the references for the most recent video. So our most recent video is Hebrew Israelite Research, episode one, and these are the references associated with the video. All right, on here, you'll see the publication date here. And if you scroll down, you'll also see the video references. And I, I do want to point out that on either side like on the right side or the left hand side we do have buttons to help you to navigate the references so right now we have references showing one through four but if i click on the button 
it'll show the next group of references. All right, so I'm gonna bring it back to references one through four um, so that we can get started. And then uh, last but not least, at the very bottom of the video, you'll see a section called video notes. These are just summary notes that are associated with the video. Uh, these are uh, topics that were covered during the video. Um, you know, feel free to come through and look through here uh, just to get a quick summary of what the video will cover. All right. All right. Again, you know, keep in mind it's a work in progress. Uh, we will add content to it over time. However, this is what we have so far. Okay, let's get started. For episode one, we want to review the Hidden Hebrews three video references. We're not going to review all the references, but just a few references that were missed or deserve additional explanation. Within the Hidden Hebrews 3 video, you should notice that we reviewed a painting within this video. So I'm gonna right click on the link and navigate to the video. Oh, a quick note about the link here. Let me go back over to our page. Right now, I don't have the uh, the actual link work. You may have to copy paste it into your, um, your web browser to navigate. But eventually, I will change this so that all you have to do is click on it, and it'll take you to the um, it'll take you to the link instead of you having to copy paste that. So that is, that is uh, something that we're working on. All right, all right. So, uh, but if you go to reference one and you follow the link for reference one, you'll notice that it'll take you to our painting. So this is the painting that was reviewed within the video, and I'm going to zoom in on this painting just so that we can review a few things in this painting. Hidden Hebrews 3, we reviewed how the children of the Jews that were in Portugal were taken from their parents. And this painting is a painting from the 1500s during the time of the Inquisition. And this was shortly after the edict was given that the Jews be taken from their parents. And on the bottom left hand side, you know, we showed this in the video, a young man being taken. And behind the young man, you'll see a young woman. Behind her, you'll see a person with a club. So I pointed that out just to show that there is correlation between this painting and our references, right? Let me show you what I mean. So if we go to reference number two, and I'm going to follow the link for this reference. I'm just going to copy, oh, double left click, and then right click, and it says go to... Um, uh, go to the link. So I'm going to follow this link here on page 129. Here we are. We're on page 129 and I'm going to zoom in so that you can see it. All right. So I'm going to go all the way to the top. Let me start at the, uh, the third line where it says the Moors immediately passed over into Africa. And as the Jews were preparing to depart, the king commanded that all their children who were not above 14 years old should be taken from their parents and educated in the Christian religion. It was a most affecting thing to see children snatched from the embraces of their mothers and fathers, embracing their children, listen, it says, violently torn from them and even beat with clubs. So I wanted to point out that in this reference, we have correlation between the Jews being beat with clubs and what we see in this painting. So in this painting, we see this uh, young man being taken, and we also see a couple of people back, a person holding a club. So there's definite correlation between the references. All right? Okay. I also like to review in these videos the description of the Jews. So we're going to go to reference number three, and we're going to follow that. Let's go to reference number three, and let's see. From reference number three, we want to go to page 141. So 141. So here we are. We are on page 141. And I'm going to zoom in here just so that you can see it on your screen and make it easier for reading it here. So I'm going to move it all the way up to the top of the screen. So if you look at the top of the screen where it reads, King John II in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas which had been discovered in 1471, and to other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And then it reads, from these banished Jews, it says, the black Portuguese 
as they are called. So a takeaway here is that the Portuguese Jews were called black Portuguese. And also note that the Portuguese and the Spanish word for black back in the 14 to 1500s was or is Negroes. Okay, so these Portuguese were called black Portuguese or Negro Portuguese. Okay, this reference gives a brief description of the Jews. So we know that they're called black or Negro Portuguese. Let's look at additional reference which describes the color of the Jews. This is reference number four. And as you see, I'm going to scroll up to the top so you can see the page number. So you see it 139. At the top of the screen, it says, Tis also a vulgar error that the Jews are all black. So he's saying that it's error to think that the Jews are all black. And it says, For this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. So basically, he's saying that the Portuguese Jews are all black. Do you get that, Israel? It says that this is only true of the Portuguese Jews. What's only true of the Portuguese Jews? That they are all black. You got it? All right. That's another reference that gives us a description of the Jews. Our references are lining up. Reference three lines up with reference four. And what you'll see is that this also lines up with references one and two as well. Okay. So let's go over to reference five. And for reference five, this is another reference that's going to help us identify the Jews on our painting. When we look at our painting, we want to be able to identify the Jews when we see it. All right. Okay. This reference is coming from the introductory section XIX. And this is on the right hand side of your screen. All right. And I'm going to start at the top and it says, he was of a middle size. He had good features in his face. It says the skin somewhat black, right? The skin somewhat black, black curly hair, long eyebrows, and of the same color, so that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews, all right? So this reference tells us that just by his looks, they could tell that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. This reference is lining up with the previous references in the previous descriptions of the Jews. I do want to take time to point out that this is why I prefer using older references. Like if you use references that date back to the 1800s and older, this is the description that you will find in these books. But it's when you use newer references, like references from the 1900s and newer, you will find a totally different description of the Jews in those books. Okay, so now that we have a good understanding of what the Jews look like, let's go back over to our painting. All right, so now that we know that the Jews were black and that we know that the children were taken from the parents and that they were taken from their parents using clubs, we can now look at this painting and identify a few things. We already talked about the child being taken off to the left, and he, notice that he's black, right? So this matches the description of the Jews. And we also see the person behind him with club. This also matches up with what we read in our references. Also during the Inquisition and also in Hidden Hebrews 3, we covered Alto de Faze. So Alto de Faze was the burning of the Jews by the Christian church. And one thing to keep in mind about Alto de Fe's is that they were usually held in one of two places. Alto de Fe's were held on Sunday, and they were usually either held at the church or they were held at the city square. Now, this painting just so happens to be a painting of the city square in Lisbon. And when we look in the middle of this painting, so let me zoom out just so that you can see that this is in the middle here, or somewhat in the middle. And I'm going to zoom back in to this, uh, to the gentleman in the middle. And I don't know if you can see it on your screen, depending on the resolution on your monitor, but this gentleman is being burned. So this is an alto de fe. So at the, at the bottom, you'll see that there are flames um, consuming him. And then also at the top, and this is something that, that I didn't cover in previous videos, but at the top, uh, whenever someone would get burned, sometimes the church would impose some grace 
and they would choke them before they were burned instead of burning them alive. And to do that, the church would sometimes put a device on the head and neck to choke the victim before burning them. So when we look at this painting, knowing that, we also see that this gentleman has a device on his head and neck. So this too also matches up with what we've read in our references. This is an alto de fe, and notice that this gentleman too is black. The last thing I want to point out is that also during the 1500s, during the time of the Inquisition, some Jews accepted Christianity. Right? They accepted Christianity or they was forced to accept Christianity. When we look around on our painting, we also see the gentleman with a red cross on his sleeve. The Jews that were converted over to Christianity were called new Christians. What we see on our screen is we find a gentleman that matches the description of a new Christian. During the time of this painting in the 1500s, Jews were accepting Christianity. And you see a what appears to be a new Christian in the bottom right. And also during the time um, of this painting were alto de fe's. And you see the gentleman in the middle. This is, appears to be an alto de fe. And then last but not least, the children were taken from their parents with clubs. And you can see that on the bottom left. All right. So hopefully you, you learned a lot about that reference. Another topic I, I wanted to review from the Hidden Hebrews 3 video, this actually has to do with the Jews being placed on the west coast of Africa and the slave coast being named after their children. So first things first, let's review a reference to show that the Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. So for this, let's go to page 574. And this is one we've shared in a couple of different videos, so you may be familiar with it. For those that are new to the channel, I do want to review it just for, for their sake. It says that John the Third, King of Portugal, sent a colony thither, and this is talking about the west coast of Africa, above 200 years before, whom though the unwholesome air destroyed. This book was written in the 1600s, so around 200 years before this, book was the 1400s. So this matches up with what we've read so far, where we know that John II sent the Jews to the west coast of Africa in the 1400s. And let's keep reading. It says, yet the place was not left desolate, for he sent new inhabitants who first settled Guinea, next in Angola, and lastly on the island of St. Thomas, that so they might be the better used to the air that the said king sold all those Jews for slaves. One quick note, this reference is telling us that the Jews that were sent to the west coast of Africa were sold as slaves. And then it goes on to tell us why. It says, that refused to embrace the Roman religion and caused their children to be baptized. All right, so again, this book matches up with what we read so far. Children being taken from their parents, sent to the west coast of Africa to be brought up as Christians and slaves. And it says, from whom coming thither in great numbers, most of the present inhabitants were descended. All right. So this reference tells us the children were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. And actually, to be more precise, it says the Jews were placed on the west coast of Africa in great numbers. In our previous videos, we also showed that the Jews that were placed on the west coast of Africa by the Portuguese slave traders. And when the Portuguese slavers brought the Jews to the west coast of Africa, they named the slave coast after the children. They called the slave coast the kingdom of Judah. I, I do want to address this because I've seen this explanation out on the internet from time to time, and it has to do with the name of the slave coast. One explanation that's floating out there was that the Portuguese actually named the slave coast in Portuguese, help. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me go over to uh, Google Translate. We're going to translate from Portuguese to English. So we're going to translate ajuda, ajuda to English. And this is, and you'll see that from ajuda to English, it says help, right? So this is why some people would say, well, 
the Portuguese, when they called the kingdom of Judah, uh, Judah, they were just calling it help because that's where their help was coming from. They're slave helpers. That's a half truth in that uh, Judah does mean help. However, let me also show you what uh, Judah also means. So for this, I'm going to go from English to Portuguese. So I'm going to go from English to Portuguese. And we're going to translate Judah, oops, Judah to Portuguese. So you'll see from Judah to Portuguese, you'll see it means Judah. It's also translated a Judah. Okay? A Judah. So a Judah means help, and a Judah also means Judah. You got it? So a Judah means help, and a Judah also means Judah. The only difference is the accent on the A at the back. You got it? Okay. So hopefully that helps you out. If you're doing research and you come across this explanation of the, the slave coast being referred to as a Judah, and they're saying that it means help, you know, feel free to let them know that a Judah also means Judah. And what you can do is that you can also take them to this reference. Let me show you a good reference to help people get some clarification on Ajuda. All right. So on page 267, let's go down to the section of Dahomey. Let's read. It says, Dahomey, east of Great Popo, begins the Dahomey territory, guarded by the important town of Glewa, known to Europeans by the various names. I'm skipping down. It says, the old writers called it Judah. You see? And it says, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews. So not only did they call it Judah, but they said that the inhabitants were Jews. And then it says, while the neighboring river Alala, whose real name is Ephra, became the Euphrates. And it says, during the flourishing days of the slave trade, from sixteen to 18,000 were annually transported from Ajuda, as the Portuguese called this place. Let's see, were they calling it help or were they calling it Judah? According to this reference, it was called Judah. And who lived in Judah? Jews. You got it? So the old writers called it Judah. Jews lived in Judah. And the Portuguese called it a Judah, which also means Judah. All right. So hopefully that helps you in your research. And it also helps you if you run into um, those that would say that the slave coast was called a Judah, which, meant, which means help. Like I said, feel free to let them know that a Judah also means Judah. All right. And for our last reference, this was a reference that I ended up pulling at the last minute off of the Hidden Hebrews 3 video. This reference describes the end of the Inquisition, right? It shows us how the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, actually ended, and it ended by the French. And the importance of this reference is to show us where the torture chambers of the Inquisition were located. So as you listen to this reference, as we read this reference, pay close attention to where the torture chambers of the Inquisition were located. The Inquisition Revealed, page 304. It had been decreed by Napoleon that the Inquisition and the monasteries should be suppressed. Months, however, had passed away without the decree being executed. I went that night directly to Marshal Salp, told him what had taken place and reminded him of the Emperor's decree. He said I might go the next morning and destroy the Inquisition, giving me charge at the same time to take care of the pictures, library, and other things of value. I replied that my regiment was not sufficient of such a service, but if he would give me the 117th of the line and another regiment which I named, I would undertake the work. The colonel of the 117th, Colonel Delal, was an intimate friend of mine and is now the pastor of an evangelical church in France. Marshal Sout gave me the troops required. That night, the expedition was arranged, and the next morning, we proceeded at break of day to the Inquisition, which was about five miles distant from the city. A wall of great strength surrounded the buildings. I went forward with a company of soldiers, addressing one of the sentinels on the wall, summoned those within to surrender and to open the gates to the Imperial Army. The man withdrew, and after conversation, 
Apparently with someone within, he reappeared, presented his musket, and shot one of my men. This was a signal of attack. And returning to my troops, who had halted at a distance out of sight, I ordered them to advance and to open upon those who had appeared on the walls. It was soon obvious that it was an unequal warfare. The garrison was numerous, and on the walls there was a strong breastwork from behind which they kept up a destructive fire upon our men on the open plain. We had no cannon. Our scaling ladders were insufficient, the walls being higher than we expected. The gates resisted all attempts at forcing them, wishing to get through the work as quietly and as quickly as possible. I directed some trees to be cut down and trimmed, to be used as battering rams. Selecting a place where the ground sloped a little towards the wall, and so gave advantage to my men to cover with their fire those engaged in the assault. Two of these battering rams were brought to bear upon the walls. Presently, the walls began to tremble, and a breach was made, and the imperial troops rushed into the Inquisition. Here, we met with a scene for which nothing but Jewisitical effrontery is equal. <laughs> the Inquisitor General, followed by the fathers in their robes, all presented themselves as we were making our way into the interior of the place, with their arms crossed on their breasts, their fingers resting on their shoulders, as though they had been deaf to all the noise of the attack and the defense, and had just learned what was going on. They addressed themselves in the language of rebuke to their own soldiers, saying, Why do you fight our friends, the French? <laughs> their intention, no doubt, was to make us think that the defense was wholly unauthorized by them, hoping if they could make us believe that they were friendly, they should have a better opportunity of escaping. <sighs> Their Charlotte artifice did not succeed. I ordered them to be placed under guard, and all the soldiers of the Inquisition who had not escaped in the confusion to be secured as prisoners. We then proceeded to explore the rooms of the stately edifice. We passed through hall after hall, richly furnished. We found splendid paintings of a rich and extensive library, everywhere beauty, splendor, and order, such as I had never seen in any place. The architecture and the furniture, the ornaments, were such as pleased the eye and gratified the taste. But where were the gloomy cells and horrid instruments of torture? which one had been taught to expect to find in the Inquisition. We looked for them in vain. The Holy Father seemed surprised at our expecting to find such things, assured us that they had been belied, and that the Holy Catholic Church in this, as in other things, was grossly misrepresented. Although I saw through the cunning villainy of the fathers in those remarks, and knew how the Romanish Church always affects to deny its crimes and cruelties when it carries them into execution. I was ready to believe, after our careful search, that this Inquisition was different from others, of which I had heard. My friend Delisle was not, however, so easily convinced. Colonel, he said to me, You are commander this day, and as you say, it must be. But, if you would be advised by me, let us have another search. I do not believe we have seen everything yet. We accordingly again began to explore, especially in the parts underground, by marking well what portion of the buildings we were beneath. We found that we had been under every part except the great chapel of the Inquisition and the buildings adjoining. The floor of this chapel was formed of vast slabs of rich marble. The floors of the other parts of the Inquisition were either marble or of highly polished wood. We could find no entrance to vault or other indication of anything being below the chapel. <sighs> being now ready to give up the search, a thought struck Colonel Delisle, who was still sanguine of discovery. Let us get water, he said, and pour it over this floor and see if there's any place where it passes through more freely than the others. Water was immediately brought, and a careful examination made of every seam, none slabs being cemented, to see if the water passed through. 
Presently, one of the soldiers cried out that he had found it. Here! By the side of one of the marble slabs, the water was passing through fast, as though there were an opening beneath. All hands were now set at work for further discovery. The officers with their swords and the men with their bayonets were trying to clear out the scene and to raise the slab. Others began to strike the slab with all their might with the butt of their muskets in order to break it. The fathers, who had been looking on with the greatest dismay, now broke out in a loud remonstrance against our desecration of their holy and beautiful house. As they were thus engaged, one of the soldiers, who was busy with the butt of his musket, struck a part of the marble under which was a spring, and the slab partly flew up. Then the faces of the inquisitors grew pale, and they trembled, as Belshazzar when the handwriting appeared on the wall. The marble slab being raised, the top of a staircase appeared. I stepped to the altar and took one of the long candles, which was burning. Some of my men doing the same, that we might see to explore what was below. One of the inquisitors here came up to me and laying his hand gently on my arm, said with a demure in a holy book, my son, you must not take those lights with your bloody hands. Those are holy. Well, I said, pushing him back, I will take a holy thing to shed light on iniquity or lawlessness. I will bear the responsibility. We proceeded down the staircase. On reaching the floor, the first room we entered was a large square hall, on one side of which was a raised platform with seats the center one being raised considerably, being the throne of the Inquisitor General. In the center of the hall was a large block with a chain fastened to it, where the caused were chained during their examination. On leaving the Hall of Judgment, we proceeded along a passage with numerous doors. These were the cells of solitary imprisonment, from which the miserable victims were never brought out except it were for torture. Within some of these cells, we heard sounds as we advanced. On opening the doors, we witnessed such sights as I wish never to see again, the details of which are too horrible to relate. In some cells, we found bodies, apparently but a short time dead. Others were in various states of decay. We saw some of which little but the bones remained still fixed by change to the floor of the dungeon. To prevent this corruption being offensive to the occupants of the Inquisition, there were flues extending along the roofs of the cells and, and carrying the odor off to the open air. Among the living prisoners, we found aged men and women of threescore years and 10, youths and girls of 14 or 15, and others in the prime of life. Some had been there for many years and had lost count of the time since they entered. The soldiers went to work to release them from their chains and took their knapsacks, their overcoats, and other clothing to cover their nakedness. They were eager to be taken to the light of day, but having heard of the danger of this, I caused food to be given to them and then directed them gradually to be brought out to the light as they were able to bear it. We then proceeded to explore another room where there were instruments of torture. One of these was a machine on which the victim was stretched and every joint of the body, beginning with the fingers, was racked until the sufferer swooned away or died. Another engine consisted of a box in which the head and necks were immovably confined by a screw. And over this box was a vessel from which drop by drop water fell every second upon the head. This perpetual drop falling on the same spot caused most excruciating agony, agony ending, agony ending ere long in raving madness. Another infernal machine lay along horizontally to which the sufferer was bound, 
and then was placed between two beams on which scores of knives were fixed, so that by turning the machine with the crank, the flesh was torn from the limbs in small pieces. A fourth machine surpassed the others in fiendish ingenuity. Or its exterior was a beautiful woman, richly dressed with arms extending to embrace the victim. Around her feet, a semicircle was drawn. Whoever stepped over this line touched a spring, which caused the diabolical machine to open, and a thousand knives pierced them with deadly force. The sight of these machines of infernal cruelty kindled the fury of the soldiers, already enraged with the resistance they met with and the death of their comrades in assaulting the walls. They declared that they would put their prisoners to the torture. I could not stem their fury. They began with the Holy Fathers. They put one on the machine for racking the joints. Another was put under the dropping water, and terrible was the agony he seemed to suffer. The Inquisitor General was brought before the machine called the Virgin and commanded to kiss it. You have caused others to kiss it, said the soldiers. Now you must do it. They pointed their muskets and pushed him over the fatal circle. The beautiful image, instantly prepared for the embrace, clasped him with his arms, and he was cut to pieces. My heart sickened at this awful scene, and I saw no more. In the meantime, the report had reached Madrid that the prisoners of the Inquisition were open. Multitudes were hastening to the place. Fathers there were who found long-lost daughters. Mothers there, mothers, their sons. Wives were restored to their husbands. Sisters and brothers met once more. Some were friendless and unrecognized. The scene of mingled joy, surprise, and anguish no tongue could describe. While this was going on, said the colonel, I gave orders for the library and paintings and furniture to be carefully removed and sent to the city for a large quantity of gunpowder. Placing this in the vaults and subterranean places of the buildings, in a slow match being set, we all withdrew to a distance and waited the result in silence. Presently, loud cheers rent the air. The walls and the turrets of the massive structure rose majestically towards the heavens, impelled by a tremendous explosion, and fell back to the earth, a vast heap of ruin. The Inquisition was no more. Well, Israel, we've reached the end of episode one. In episode one, we reviewed a handful of references from the Hidden Hebrews 3 video. Now, be sure to stay tuned for the upcoming episodes. Yah willing, beginning with the next episode, we will begin to share some exciting references, some exciting rarely seen references about the transatlantic slave trade, the Jews, and more. So stay tuned. Be on the lookout for the next episode. Thank you for watching and Shalom.